Galatians chapter 2, I'm going to start here. And uh, not going to read all of the context. We'll just jump in verse 14. The Apostle Paul says, he says, When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh shall no flesh be justified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do praise your glorious name. We're so thankful for this wonderful plan, Lord, that you have, well, you've had from before the foundation of the world, that you have had to make us righteous. Truly, Lord, we hunger and thirst for righteousness, and we know that it is found only in Jesus Christ our Lord. We're appreciative that this righteousness is, well, that you come to live in us and that your righteousness is manifested to the world and throughout the world by you and us. Thank you, Lord, for including us in your plan. Thank you for giving us a hope that's real and that we get to be participants in. I ask that you be with me today as I preach your word, that I would communicate it clearly and it would be in accordance with your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm not going to review too much today. I'm just going to jump into uh, what these couple verses, particularly verse 16 today. We'll just say this. This issue of faith versus law was so important that the Apostle Paul was willing to go toe-to-toe, face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball with Peter on it. Paul and Peter were willing to take this discussion even in public for the sake of the church. This is how important this was. Brethren, the difference between law and faith is the difference between death and life for every individual. And it's also the difference if if the church is going to be a minister of life as God desires us to be or if we will the church will fall by the wayside and be swallowed up along with the rest of what Satan devours. Jesus did say, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The Lord's church, when functioning properly, when understanding who we are in Christ, when living by faith, the Lord's church is the one thing that can go into the gates of Hades and be victorious. If you're interested in life, if you're interested in victory, then what is shared through the rest of the book of Galatians is, well, in one sense, I'll say this, there's nothing more important that you could get a hold of. If you don't get a hold of this, you'll die. And if none of us get a hold of this, this congregation in Bozeman would die. I'm taking that one off the table. By God's grace, as long as I live, and I hope you will say that, as long as you live, living by faith is, and and the, the life going forth from here is going to happen. I appreciate everybody who's here today wanting to be a part of this kingdom that Andrew talked about. I want to hit some things today, justified, what it means to be justified. I want to talk about quickly about the works of the law and their inability to justify us. Mostly I want to key in on the faith of Christ and the fact that we believe in Christ. I know I read verse 16 in uh, the way it's translated in the New American Standard. I want to read verse 16 again. If you would look with me in your Bibles, Galatians 2, 16. I actually have notes up here where I've read, so if it's easier, actually, you can read what's up here where I've hand-scrawled some stuff in mine. Okay. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through the faith of Christ Jesus... Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. A little difference here, okay? And I do want to emphasize the faith of Christ Jesus. And we'll 
We'll get to that a little bit later. Justified. What's it mean to be justified? The, I don't know if anybody, the smoke's been getting anybody else's throat, but I have not been able to talk very well recently, so I'm hoping, I don't know whose water this is. I should probably not, that might not help. I'm going to grab what I know is mine. I almost did that. That was, that was close. Um, <laughs> That's gross, Cliff. <laughs> but the, the word justified, the Greek word come, is, that's used here is a form of dikaio. Okay, we might hear, you might think of hearing the word, well, does this, does this word sound remotely familiar with you, to you? How about dikaios? Righteousness. Okay? When we talk about the, the scriptural word for justified or being just is The same word is righteous. So we are justified. We are, my my friend Elvin Hopper liked to say, we are declared to be righteous. And I like this. Maybe we could even say this a little further. We are shown to be righteous. God is making us just. Now I purposely put on here a, a picture here. Cost and value. And uh, maybe I jumped ahead here. I do, I do remember, I've heard it said before, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. And that's part of it. It's actually a good starting. I kind of like the, the picture in my mind, just as if I'd never sinned. But there's even more than that, isn't there? Okay? Because through the gospel, the righteousness of God is manifest, is made known. And it's, the, guys, the end of the gospel is not just stop sinning. That's a part of the gospel, but the end of the gospel is so much more than that. We are God's army. And so his righteousness is being made known through us. But in order for this to work, you got the cost of sin. And so I I put this picture. What's what's the cost of sin? Every person has to process that at some point in time. We We live in a society that really tries to dull the conscience... But the cost of sin is life. You sin, you die. The wages of sin is death. And so the question comes up, when you come to a realization of sin in your life caused you to die, the question comes up, what's of equal value? How, do, how does this scale... What's, what's of equal value? How does this thing become clear again? I don't know how this is going to work, guys, but I'm going to do my best. Thanks to Bob Woodburn for this. It's not perfectly balanced right now, so the nice thing is we're just going to... Yeah, I'm going to leave it at one. One sin. Okay? One sin, you're in trouble cost of life. And so there's a human tendency, as you process through that, okay, what can I do to make this right? I hope that's a question everybody asks. What do I do to make this right? How do I get where I'm in good standing again with God? And that's a good question to ask. It comes up in the scriptures. Micah, the prophet, asks it in chapter 6. With what shall I come before the Lord most high? And he lists a bunch of things, and he actually says, shall I present the fruit of my body, my firstborn, for the sin of my soul? You start thinking through this. Could I offer my son Matthew? God, would that, would that make this equal? Won't work. Can't, you cannot justify yourself. But it's, it's natural human tendency. How about, I might say Catholic guilt. If I do enough, the Pope before this one, I believe, used to start his day by lashing himself every morning to try to pay the price <coughs> to get this to be equal. How about what's, who's called Mother Teresa? Maybe if I do enough good things, Maybe I can get this to balance out. If I put enough good things onto here, guys, it, it will never work. 
can't do it. So that's, I think I wanted to say one other thing here. At a personal level, you, there's different ways that we might approach this. But typically the human being, when trying to figure out how to solve this problem, does one of two things. Either tries to duck and hide and, not, and minimize and trivialize and make this not such a big deal. That's not really what the scale says. You, just be honest for, with me for a second. You ever stepped on the bathroom scale and said, there's something wrong with this scale? <laughs> like this thing must, some, something's broken with this scale. There's no way. That's what a lot of people do when it comes to the scale of Christianity. But you don't get to change that. You don't get to recalibrate. It is calibrated. And nothing you can do is going to change the calibration on that. And so people tend to, to justify, minimize, trivialize, say the scale's broken. That's not true. That doesn't work. Actually, when we went through the Creation Museum at Joseph and Lydia's, Lydia's wedding there in Glendive, you could tell a lot of people that were going through there were already... I'll just say in a general sense, Bible believers. But there was a couple, a few bikers that were in there in our vicinity. And I heard them starting to go off. I don't, why? It's just this God who if you don't please, you're in trouble. And you're going to basically fry for things you've done wrong. And I kind of whipped around and was, I would have been interested in engaging. And they, well, and then they said, yeah, there's some interesting stuff here. And they kind of shift. But, but what were they doing? The scale is wrong. Trying to get out of that. Then there's other people say, okay, if, if I do enough good, have you ever in your life thought, okay, I made this mistake here. I did something that wasn't very loving to Julie. If I grab flowers and chocolate, we can come back to a base. Sometimes people think of their relationship with God that way. If I do this, if I do enough good, I can come back to a standing. The scripture's emphatic about this, the works of the law. By the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. You can't be justified by the works of the law. Now the commandment itself, don't get me wrong, the commandment's righteous. It is just. Romans tells us that. It sets a standard of what is required. So it is a correctly calibrated scale. But the scripture is also emphatic, if you break one, you break them all. One of the problems, well, he who practices them shall live by them. We talked about the Ten Commandments today in adult Bible school class. How many of you are relatively familiar with the Ten Commandments? How many of you have kept those Ten Commandments perfectly or whole life to this point in time. Is everybody awake out there? Not one of us has? Scripture's clear on that. Okay? He who practices them shall live by them. Wow, nobody's done And the record of the human race is nobody has done it. And here's why no, by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The law only brings Condemnation. There's nothing rehabilitative about it. Okay. The law cannot change who you are inside. It is completely powerless to do so. I've used illustrations. We all have experienced I Just a very simple one for me. I do like to drive fast. And the speed limit is completely powerless to change what I want to do. I do make sure I don't get caught, but that is the extent of the law. It cannot, by the way, I heard somebody, somebody did pretty good in the Big Sky State Games arm wrestling yesterday, and uh, it was fun seeing Caden do that, but he got a little antsy on the way home. I don't know if it was the weight of those medals, helping you put the pedal to the metal or what, but I uh, heard somebody had a little interaction with a policeman yesterday, and uh, that's probably a bad influence from Elena, because you, you, when, when I first met you, you actually followed the rules. So, sorry about that. Okay. But the law, the law is powerless. The law is powerless to rehabilitate. Okay. A loose paraphrase of the early part of Romans 10, and I'll just, I've thought about this in my mind. How do I make this right? 
you want to try this on for size, basically, you go down, you descend into Hades. Anybody, we, Andrew asked this morning, the opening, who, who's ready for heaven? Raise your hand if you're ready for heaven. Okay? And then I'd like to have the comparison, we're ready to live today. And, but I'm ready for heaven. My family can tell you, sometimes it bothers them how much I talk about, like, I, I'm looking forward to the day that it's, take me, Lord. But I, recently I went on some roller coasters, and those things get me. Aftershock at Silverwood, it gets me like, not, I literally, Julie thought this was ridiculous, but I, I literally make sure I'm at peace with my maker on those rides. I'm like, okay, I know where, I, yeah, I don't know who else gets that afraid, but I get that afraid. Okay? So it's like, okay, it, it's one thing to say, I'm ready for heaven, and I am, but I also got to think through, okay, Lord, you got me, where, if this happens, where, like, I feel that. Do I want to, do I want to descend into Hades by my own power? What if I'm the guy on the cross there, and by my own doing, say, it's finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. If it was by my own doings, I'm ending up on the wrong side down there. And I am powerless to snap those bonds and take it up with me. Romans 10 basically said, my loose paraphrase, the first part of this, you want to be justified by law, you be the guy that descends into Hades, you break the bonds of sin and death, and then you rise and you ascend into heaven before and present yourself before the Lord. Impossible. Get off the table, brethren. You cannot be justified by the works of the law. If you find yourself going there, and I have, okay, well, I, do this, do this. <clears throat> You're going about it the wrong way. It will never, ever work. By the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. So what, what does this passage say about how, how we're justified? He said, only way, only one way these scales can be balanced, only God can justify. And again, I, I will emphasize this for a second. You have two options in your life. I have two options in my life. I either try to justify myself or I'm going to allow God to justify me. Now, kids are kind of fun because kids haven't figured out sometimes all the complicated ways, some of them have not yet figured out all the complicated ways of lying. And so you have a conversation with kids. My favorite used to be with Matthew and Caleb. Okay? And in those scenarios, sometimes the ability to justify yourself some of us a little more real, husband and wife. Well, you, well, you, well, you. Well, that's not exactly the way. It went. Hey, I'm never going to win anyways. I don't remember details well enough. I'm in trouble on those ones personally. Okay, But you cannot, you start trying to, basically what I'm saying is, you think about this, you start trying to blame everybody else for why. It's very real. In Genesis, when God shows up, Adam, where are you? Hiding, Why? I'm naked. Who told you? Who told you you're naked? Well, this woman whom you gave me. Adam blames both his wife and God in the same sentence. The, the, the human being's mental gym, ability to do mental gymnastics and try to justify himself. Get that off the table, brethren. If there is sin in your life that is unresolved, don't try to justify yourself. Get it off the table. Go before God in honesty. Here he says, we can be justified by the faith of Christ. If you are not yet in Christ, Jesus, if you haven't been immersed into Christ, you're in trouble. You got to get that resolved. If you are in Christ, then you can honestly come before God and say, okay, God, how are you going to justify me? I need to put my faith in you. I do want to just real quickly, why I edited this, the faith in Christ, of Christ Jesus. King James got it right from the Greek. I just want to show you real quick. Oftentimes this shows up in the scriptures. The faith of Jesus Christ. 
Hey, multiple scriptures there. I'm not going through all of them today. <clears throat> so I do want to talk about this, though. What does the faith of Christ mean? As we move on in Galatians, it will get a little more, our part will get a little more personal. Okay? What is my responsibility in this? But I want to pan back today and just realize, he says, we're justified by the faith of Christ. I want to compare, contrast this with the law of Moses. Because when I first heard somebody talk about the faith of Christ, and, and I, everybody listen up for a second, I can still tell by some of us, the way we say this, that we don't quite understand this scripturally, okay? And I will tell you, there was a point in time I didn't understand this scripturally. I heard this, the first time I heard the faith of Christ, by the way, the faith of Christ does justify us. I better finish this thing. More than enough, okay? God's grace is sufficient. But I first heard this, and I heard it presented like the faith that Jesus had while he was here is the same faith that we need to have. And my brain said, threw up a couple red flags. Okay. Did Jesus live by faith? Yes. Is he the author and perfecter of faith? Yes. Did he sh He's the one who did keep the law perfectly. Did he do it by keeping the law? No, he did it by living by faith. All of those things are true. But let me ask you a question. Is your personal faith picture ever going to be the same personal faith picture that Jesus had while Jesus was here on earth? It can't be the same. He is the Son of God. He is the one who came to pay the price, His blood. So it, what I'm saying is it can't match up perfectly. When the scripture talks about the faith of Christ, it is not talking about Jesus' personal faith any more than if you hear the law of Moses, is the law of Moses Moses' personal laws? No. Okay. The law of Moses is not Moses' personal law. It's the system of law by God given through Moses. So that helps us. I, for, it helps me. Okay. I actually heard my dad preach on this a number of years ago, and it was like, now I, I really get it. There's a contrast here. This is not talking about Jesus' personal faith. It's talking about a system of thought. A system, a new system of faith that's the New Testament that's brought in through Jesus Christ. Okay. Law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the mediator of this new covenant. It helps me sometimes to think about it this way. God's process. Cliff's stewardship was awesome today. Okay. The Lord, all those stars, the Lord knows them by name. The Lord knows his. Is there a system that God has in place? The, I'll maybe take the planets. I'll just jump for a second. Is there a system that God has in place for the planets and the way that they orbit around the sun? System. Get out the microscope. DNA. Is there a system for the way that life in the physical realm, life produces life? Is there a system? Yes. God is the most amazing systems or process engineer that you could ever think of. There is he, the process engineer. If you think about the traffic that Cliff was talking about flowing, think about the traffic within the human cell. How is that all that stuff regulated? There's a system. God has this beautiful system in place for life on this planet, for life, even the bios, for us to be alive. Any of you guys ever seen the movie Privileged Planet? It's pretty old now. But basically... All these things that make earth the perfect place for life. Design. Perfectly designed system. I like to think of it as God's process. Let me, let me ask a question. If God made a perfect system for physical life on this planet, do you think God is able to make the perfect system for spiritual life? That perfect system was not the Old Testament, in case you were wondering. He had to put that in place until the coming of Christ okay, for man's benefit. But God has a process, and this process works perfectly, and that's what we are talking about when we talk about the faith of Christ. It is an objective system. You don't have to guess. It's not a, a blind leap. It's not a, Mr. J. Wilson hit on some of this stuff. 
All, almost all of the modern translations translate this faith in Christ. There is such a thing as faith in Christ. But these places, they change it because okay, there, there's confusion. The worldview dictates our translation. How many of you guys here believe there's such a thing as subjective truth? How about objective truth? How many believe there's object? Okay, so if I say, Tom Jacobs, your truth. Okay? You just live in your truth. Do you, does that make sense to you? Yeah. No, there, there has to be something more than your truth, right? There is, a, is there such thing as truth? Okay? We all believe there's such thing as truth. But here's, here's the interesting thing. Even a lot of people in the world don't, by the way, in case you haven't forgotten, but even people that I Bible say with that say they believe in objective truth. And I would guess some of us here, even though we can logically say there is such a thing as truth, as reality, we still have bought, in, in the subconscious, we've bought a lot more into emotional thinking that dictates reality instead of making sure that reality dictates our emotions. Follow this through with me. Francis Schaeffer talked about the the drug culture, and one of the things the drug culture brought in is finding the truth inside one's own head. Okay. When you have let, this, and TV, I always thought TV is just an amazing thing, this box in your living room that tells you how to think. Okay. Well, we've come a long way since TV, haven't we? Now, around the world, everybody's got these phones that tell you how to think. How to, and it, guys, almost everything out there is based off emotionalism. And so subconsciously, you start buying into a what I feel is what dictates reality. This system of faith, first and foremost, is objective. It is something that you can come back to that you know is true. It's grounded in reality. And that's an important place to, to start. And giving us something that's completely objective. That allows us to have conviction in what this says. I was thinking about patriotism when Andrew said that. And the first time he said the word patriotism, I was like, what did he just say? And a picture that popped into my mind was, fight, fight. You know, I, I, your example was better. I like that example. But I thinking, okay, spiritually, what would give us a conviction to fight, fight for this? It has to be based in absolute reality. And so the faith of Christ, other terms for this that you'll see in the scripture, there's a bunch of them actually, just some I wrote down. Faith of Christ, new covenant, ministry of the spirit. I love that one. Uh, ministry of righteousness, we could say. The gospel, the way, apostles' doctrine, grace, law of liberty, and more. Okay? These are different ways the scripture speaks of the new covenant, but it is real. It is a system of thought. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you guys here would like it if we had a, a creed for this congregation? We believe. Anybody here vote in favor of that? It's, it's even really hard on the internet to say this is what we believe. How do you improve on the New Testament? There is no creed that could ever improve on the New Testament. Okay? So there are some things that, that the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is going to bring out in Galatians that's really important about the way we read the New Testament. But you, there is no shortcutting the system of thought that God expresses throughout the New Testament. God's process is is in there. And it is perfectly designed for us as we dig in to understand God and the why. Why he does things the way he does them. Honestly, there's, there's some things the scripture gives us to, to make sure our paradigm is right. But honestly, nobody can shortcut this and do it for you. I, I won't preach on that further today other than, isn't it fun to know 
God, who he is and why he does the things he does. Isn't it fun to know who he made me to be and why things work this way? One of my favorite books, the book of Romans, because I, I figured out God explains in there not just law and faith, but why law doesn't work. And it matches up with my personal experience. My personal experience is not paramount. The scripture is paramount. But God knows me. He knows you. And if you ever tried to be justified by law, you fear this. And he tells you, this is why this doesn't work. And this is why faith works. The scripture is fun when you start figuring this out. Okay? I would encourage you to do it. But it's objective system of thought. You know it's a legal document. No changes. Document of authority. Faith comes how? Then. Anybody ever pray, increase my faith? I do. Lord, help my unbelief. I do. But one thing that God gives us clearly that we can do to increase our faith, faith comes by hearing. And what is that hearing? Hearing by the word of Christ. And God lays out the testimony, the proof. It's there. Now, here's an important thing to me. When it comes to process, I don't know how you guys are, but I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical of the news that I hear. I'm skeptical of systems and processes that people are always putting forth. Okay. So I'll have people tell me, the carnivore diet, and I've seen the carnivore diet work for some people. Plant-based diet. I ain't seen plant-based. Everybody wants to, to tell you this, this system that's the secret sauce, right? And I, I know enough to know rock hard abs in 10 days. That one's not true. I know that. Okay? I know it's going to take longer, but, but what actually works? Hey, and I'm, I'm just skeptical. I don't ever know what works. If I don't think something works, or I'm not sure, that something works, how's my buy-in going to be? As soon as it gets a little tough and the flesh doesn't want to do whatever this system says, what, what will you, you'll take the out, won't you? Anybody else tried this kind of thing? Lifting program, running program, anything? And you start having questions about it, and it's like, as soon as you're like, I don't know if this really works, then the next time I want that milkshake yeah I don't think that system works anyways <laughs> you take the out so scripturally it's important we know God's system works that ob objective truth that he's given to us and the scripture actually tells us the beautiful thing about this new testament when when properly understood I've seen people trade an old law for a new law and that never works old rules for new rules that never worked. But when properly understood, the New Testament, the scripture says, is written in our minds and on our hearts. What does, what does that mean? Well, it changes the way we think, first of all. Any of you guys' worldview changed since you've been a Christian? I know people I Bible say with that aren't Christians yet. I've seen their worldview dra drastically change from going from an agnostic to a general. There's a God who's real. It changes the way you start seeing everything. So this changes the way we think, and it actually is the only way to get your thinking right. That's why we engage in renewing of the mind. But it also changes what we want. When it's written on our heart, it changes the very desires. The fleshly desires are minimized and put to death. The spiritual desires grow until that is the dominant force in our life. Changes what we want. It changes, here's, it changes who we are. That's the power of the New Testament. It changes who we are from the inside. It produces righteousness in us. Let's, let's read this from Romans 8 real quickly. Romans 8, 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh is an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Listen to this. In order that the requirement of the law 
That has to do with dikaios again. The righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This system of faith, brethren, produces righteousness in us. We are not going to be justified on our own. And I, and I, I don't think I communicated this clearly today. I'll wrap it up at the end. Okay. But we are never going to be justified by a righteousness of our own based on the law. Okay. Our justification comes from righteousness that is found in Jesus Christ, that he produces within us. So the Apostle Paul says, hey guys, we're, we're Jews by sinners. Not, we're Jews by nature, not sinners from among the Gentiles. We've known the law all along. Okay. So but we ourselves are not going back and living under the law. We know we're justified by the faith of Christ. And so he says, we believe in Christ. There is a personal application. And this is the part that only you can answer. And I would encourage you. There was a, a Mormon neighbor that I had, and she said it bothered her always whenever she had questions, that they said, doubt your doubts, not your faith. So basically just, Close your brain and swallow. Okay. Scripture doesn't tell us that. Okay. We believe in Christ. We go back to that objective system and we say, okay, do I believe this? Do I believe this? And you can continue to go back and lay stacks on that faith. And there, so we believe in Christ. This gives us, the, the faith of Christ gives us absolute conviction to buy into the picture that God has given to us. There's a lot more to this. But I'm just going to simplify this today, fast forwarding to the end. What is the ultimate picture that this gives us? The ultimate picture that this gives us is the picture of the glorified Christ. This is who we are being transformed into. Okay. 2 Corinthians 3.18, if you're not familiar with that, this is where God is going. We all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed in the same image. I'll just pause here. If you already have the habit of reading your Bible every day, great. I want to encourage you, when you read your Bible, what are you looking for? Are you looking for, how does this apply to me today? There, there's things you'll carry with you today, I guarantee you. But what are you looking for? It should be to behold the glory of God in the face of Christ. It should be to see the glorified Christ. If you're memorizing scripture, what's the point? To go through and be able to hit your checklist and be able to spit this stuff out by rote? Or is it to see the glorified Christ? When you're praying, what's the purpose behind it? To see the glorified Christ. He transforms us. That is the ultimate picture. So, as I wrap this up, I do want to clarify just a couple things. We're justified. When we're immersed into Christ, we do I want to get Romans 5, 1 into my brain. I got to turn there, sorry. <clears throat> Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. We've been justified by faith. Okay. Hear me out. This doesn't mean that your performance today has to be perfectly righteous to be justified. God justifies you. We're justified by the blood of Christ that he offered in the Holy of Holies. If you're in Christ, if you've been immersed into Christ, you stand justified. But the end of that is not just, hey, I'm justified. The end of this is the system the faith of Christ Jesus produces in us a practicing righteousness. So it's not by the works of the law. You don't do it by trying harder to do everything right. You do it by believing more. It's by the faith of Christ. We believe in Christ Jesus. You know, I'm going to give an example of the Bobcat football team a number of years ago. We, had, we went through a losing, well, we'd been a good team, went through a losing we're a losing program for a little while, and they brought in a new coach, Jeff Choate. And Jeff Choate was here for four years. 
in his first two years, his first year in particular, wasn't very successful. Okay, four and seven, I think. Okay. His second year, a little better. And then the third and fourth years were, were pretty good okay, in the playoffs and uh, getting to be national championship contenders. But one of the things that he said that I really like, and I want you to think about this from a scriptural perspective. He says, one of the things we ha hang our hat on in this program is to have the courage to live our lives as we see ourselves, not as others see us. Bobcats were picked to finish whatever in the conference. He says, what they think about us does not matter. We have the courage to live our lives the way we see ourselves. Brethren, whatever the world says about you, about this congregation, whatever the devil tries, does not matter. We have the courage to see ourselves the way Christ sees us. Amen? And so we don't let somebody else define us. I'm stealing the re reworking a little bit the rest of this. And we don't let setbacks deter us from our goals. We have the courage to live our lives the way that Jesus sees us. God's the one who justifies. Who's the one who condemns? God has justified us. He has made us righteous. Oh, one thing Jeff Choate said when he got here, he said, at first you lose big, then you lose small, then you win small, then you win big. The law wants to impose right away looking good and there's no real victory. When a person's first immersed into Christ and you are living by faith and it's not just about getting the externals right, sometimes it looks like you're losing big. That's okay. You're justified by Christ. Then you start learning and you start, the system of faith starts becoming real in your life. You're buying into that. You're getting a hold of it. You're understanding of it. And you start overcoming sin in your life. You start overcoming self. And maybe you still lose, losing small. And then you're getting hold more of this and you start winning day after day after day. Putting days of winning together for Christ. Doesn't that feel good? But brethren, that's, that's winning small. The reason God has done all of this is so that we can go out and impact other people. Help build the kingdom. Help make heaven a better place by having other souls there. That's winning big. I think the single biggest detriment to, act, to true evangelism is if you aren't winning in your own personal life. You can't, you can't consistently, sustainably Go and win the world if you're not experiencing the joys of victory. So God has a plan. And it's worth digging into the plan. This system of faith. Dig into the New Testament. How does this work? Why does it work this way? Figure it out and have fun figuring out the system. There are people who can help you. The Apostle Paul through the Spirit is going to through the rest of Galatians. But it is a fun thing. Have the courage to live your life the way that Jesus sees you. Let's win big for Christ, wherever you are. If you're losing big, don't get discouraged. If you have the faith of Christ, you are justified. If you're losing small, don't get discouraged. You're on the path. If you're winning small, all right, this is starting to get fun. And then, but don't, don't end there. It's not so we can sit on these chairs and be perfect together. It's so that we can go and be warriors in the world and take this gospel to a world that so desperately needs life and victory. Amen?